First, who am I? Uh, Keith Basil. I am a product manager in the cloud platforms business unit, and I cover security for OpenStack and OpenShift. And so uh, what I'm going to introduce today is a compliance uh, driven approach to better security. And I'm going to introduce this concept of compliance as code and what that means. So let's actually jump into it and get started. So fundamentally, here's the problem. Uh, let me wait for the slides to uh, advance. Yes. Okay. So there's about a four second delay. Um, we've taken in, internally um, an effort to research the many global compliance frameworks. And so uh, Red Hat being a global company, we run into these daily with our customers. So for example, in Australia, there's a framework uh, recommendations around what's called the essential eight, like the essential eight things you need to do to lock down your, your computer system uh, or cloud in infrastructure, right? Um, we also work with an organization called ANSI in France, who is responsible for uh, enforcing security policy for things that are labeled as critical infrastructure to the country, right? And then we have our friends here in the U.S. government. Um, we have really good relationships with NIST and the DOD and IC communities where we are uh, helping make our products more secure to meet their requirements. So the takeaway here is that you've got geographical boundaries, you've got industry uh, specificity for these risk management frameworks. And as a product manager who kind of grew up in the D.C. metro area, I understand like the contractor mentality, right? And so my dream as a product manager was always to have a cloud um, product that would solve for these security problems to make the job of the compliance and audit folks a little bit easier by checking things out of the box. But as you can see from this slide, um, there's quite a few things globally that we need to be aware of. And it could drive you crazy as a product manager trying to pivot and answer questions along uh, these many lines. Uh, not to uh, make it even more complex, but uh, compliance is a full stack exercise. Um, Kirsten had a slide that was very appropriate about Kubernetes done right being very, very hard. And so um, I wanted to call out a little bit more detail here in that the compliance uh, that we look at, we have to look at everything from the hardware, from the host level, all the way up through the stack. That means, you know, what type of operating system are you running? Uh, the kernel matters in this regard because there are certain security facilities, particularly around Kubernetes and container uh, hosting that are absolutely critical to compartmentalizing, uh, you know, the workloads on your Kubernetes uh, platform, right? So namespaces, system calls, reduction of privileges uh, via Linux capabilities, locking everything down with SE Linux, and then for more extreme environments or having uh, certified crypto, you want to make sure that that kernel enables FIPS, right? So these are just some low-level pieces and parts, the Legos, if you will, that actually build up um, and that we have to take into account when it comes to compliance. Um, and so let's take it one step further, <laughs> okay? So on the right, uh, when the slide loads, I'll show you. On the right, we have our listing of all the risk management frameworks, right? Again, geographically bound, industry bound, maybe even a mixture. And then on the left, we have OpenShift as an example of an infrastructure as a service offering that we need to secure and lock down. Um, I'm happy that Diane mentioned the uh, compliance officer uh, role at the top of the call because this is the nightmare <laughs> that compliance op uh, officers have to deal with because on the left, you have an infrastructure stack that changes or iterates every three months upstream. So Kubernetes is a very, very fast moving upstream open source project, right? And then you have to marry that against one of the frameworks on the right. And so, for example, if we say we're going to get uh, our OpenShift environment FedRAMP moderate um, enabled, right? That means that we have to take the time to document all of the things that go into doing Kubernetes right, right? It's a hard problem. So we have to build what's called a system security plan, uh, as an example. And that basically documents how you address all of the controls that are specified in FedRAMP. I mean, how are you gonna remediate? What's your response to this thing and to that thing, right? And so there's there's gap analysis, there's audit and remediations. Your auditor, your third party auditor is gonna come in and give you a punch list of everything that's wrong. And so these things uh, take a long time. So if we set out today to say, hey, we're gonna go get FedRAMP moderate and what's called an ATO, an authority to operate for FedRAMP moderate, then that literally could be a nine month to 18 month process, right? And so if Kubernetes 
and and by uh, downstream OpenShift are changing and doing releases every three months. When you start the clock on your your submission, you're going to be at minimum two or three versions behind what you've documented, right? And so, basically, the takeaway here is that the hamster wheel that that you see on this slide does not stop moving. In fact, it gets worse, right? And so, uh, doing these things manually, you know, addressing uh, you know FedRAMP compliance, NIST uh, overall 853 compliance, or going for PCI DSS, et cetera. These things are heavy uh, processes, and so we want to shortcut this. And this compliance as code approach is exactly how we approach that. So let's talk about the solution. Um, before we go into the detail of the solution, I want to talk about um, the approach, right? And so we, after we've done our research against the risk management frameworks that we run into as a company, um, we decided to settle on two things. One is NIST, the NIST 853 control set, because um, there's a lot of overlap um, with NIST and other frameworks kind of look to the US as the gold standard. And so uh, what that does for us is it gives, it gives us leverage, okay? Um, meaning that if we can solve for, let's say, the 853 controls that have been carved out for FISMA, or FedRAMP, if we can solve for those, we're gonna get probably 80 to 90% of all the other frameworks out of the box in terms of meeting those requirements. And the other logo that I put on this slide is the Cloud Security Alliance. And let me let me talk about uh, a really cool tool that these guys have. They have this thing called the Cloud Controls Matrix. Uh, it is, it's essentially a spreadsheet and it acts as kind of a Rosetta Stone for uh, mapping how you address this particular control um, and it shows you how you can apply that to other ones, other frameworks. So, for example, if we solve for um, configuration management in NIST as a, a family of, of controls, then we can see that our answers to how we do configuration management could be applied to ISO, to HIPAA, uh, mm -hmm. to PCI, DSS, et cetera. So it's a really cool tool in that regard. It's kind of a, a roadmap to mapping down uh, into the other frameworks. And so, um, Going more specifically uh, from a Red Hat perspective, I want to talk about how we approach this with OpenShift as an example. So on the left, you'll see a what I call the FedRAMP cheat sheet, right? So this is basically a summary of the control families that you will find applicable to a FedRAMP um, deployment, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And so um, some of these are highlighted in the green circle, like access control and oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, Diane, can we mute that person that's on the call? Okay, so on the left is the FedRAMP cheat sheet, as I said. And so as a software company, um, we can only, Red Hat can only influence and provide guidance for the things that are within our scope. For example, um, you'll see uh, personnel security on that list on the left there, the PS uh, family of controls. Well. Red Hat is not in the business of doing background checks on people, right? So for example, in FedRAMP Moderate, the folks who have hands-on keyboard to administrate your system must be US citizens, for example, right? So th that's up to the organization to figure out and address uh, how they're gonna um, solve for that control. It's not a software issue, right? So I just wanted to make sure that the folks on the call here understood that uh, the things that we've highlighted here are the things that we have influence over. And, and largely there are technical and system level uh, control families, right? And uh, the last thing I'll say before we go to the next slide is that uh, the green that you see there is an internal tool that we created to do a complete assessment against the more than 1400 controls that you'll see in uh, NIST 853. So this is our kind of internal uh, barometer, if you will, on how we're meeting uh, from a product perspective, uh, FedRAMP or FISMA, low, moderate and high as an example. And we'd be, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that if there's any questions around our approach here around security. So going back to the concept of compliance as code, what is the magic, okay? What, what are we doing here that's different? So as I alluded to before, the process is very heavy, it's intense, it's very manual in terms of building documentation, uh, uh, documenting the system, uh, all the controls and all the configs and, and the knobs and such that you do to make the system more secure. What we wanna do is to codify that knowledge, right? in areas where we have domain expertise, right? So for example, 
Um, think of it as building a cake. And I'm gonna use this cake analogy because I think it's effective here. So uh, imagine if you will, we're gonna bake a cake in layers. We're gonna build each layer of the cake at a time. And now we're gonna deploy OpenShift for a, a federal government use case. So number one, we need to figure out where the system is going to reside physically, right? So maybe we pick a data center somewhere in Ashburn, Virginia, that's close to you know our, our, our folks. And we're gonna to say to that data center uh, owner, give me your compliances code or point me to the repo that shows your compliances code artifacts. So we could basically in theory, just do a, a pull and pull down all of the data center um, remediations like and, and descriptions, for example, and narrative pieces. So what does that mean? That means that we now have in text form uh, information about the physical barriers around the data center, information about the security background checks of the security folks that physically reside in that data center, the man traps, what is the level of redundancy for power and ping for the for the network, how, is, how are the cages built out, et cetera. So now we can just pull, do a git pull, pull that down. We have that in a JSON formatted format where we can drop that in uh, as the bottom of the cake. And then going one step forward, we may say, hey, if we're gonna use, let's say Dell hardware, hey Dell, show me your compliances code repo that describes the hardware uh, security that you have for your platform, right? So maybe this will describe TPMs and hardware attestation, for example, and how that's done. So we can pull that in. And then we go up the next layer up. Let's talk about Rail Core OS as an operating system. So now we're starting getting into the Red Hat uh, layers of the cake. And then we as Red Hat and we uh, on the product management team wanna make sure that we provide those layers of the cake and that they're fully complete. And then finally, going back to the scopes that we aren't responsible for, maybe the personnel security is an in-house thing with a private repo and they build out all of that into a repo that specifies via JSON um, all of the uh, personal security procedures that they put in place. So now we've got the entire cake. We've got a directory full of like artifacts. There's tooling within this community uh, called compliance masonry, for example. You can point that to the artifacts that we just assembled and actually bake the cake. It's like putting it in the oven, right? And so boom, once this tooling runs, it will build a 400 page Word document that's the start of your system security plan in a matter of minutes, which is phenomenal, right? And so um, this is the power of treating compliance as code where now we have um, very close to real time, uh, a status on the actual compliance implementation for each one of those layers in the cake. So for example, on the OpenShift team, our goal is to make our security profiles like coterminous or released in parallel with the next version of OpenShift. So for example, if OpenShift 4.5 comes out, we'd love to publish the compliances code profile uh, for FedRAMP, for example, for OpenShift 4.5 and then 4.6, 4.7. So that way anybody consuming this, this work downstream can just pull the latest, rerun the tooling and have immediate updates to their SSPs and whatever other tooling uh, can come out of that. And the last thing here that's really critical is that the compliance as code work is really two parts. There's the text part, the narrative that describes your uh, responses in the system security plan. And then there's also uh, a baseline set of content that does auditing and remediation. So what does that mean? Uh, there's actually code code in the compliance as code piece that will allow you to basically um, analyze, audit, and, and attest that your system is in compliance against those controls that we've defined. And if it's not, you'll have the option to come back and force it to be in compliance via the remediation content that's supplied with that profile. So it's very, very powerful uh, in that regard in terms of giving us leverage to maintain um, relevance and accuracy with our compliance uh, processes. And so let's actually look at it uh, a little bit in action here. So on the next slide, we talk about um, the process and going from left to right, this is, typically how it goes. So you'll see on the left guides and documentation. This could be auditor docs, uh, security requirement guides in, in the DOD space, we call them SRGs, uh, just general configuration guides on how to you know, secure the system or um, make changes that are not necessarily related to security, but need to be accounted for. And then you have you know, properly published and blessed what we call STIGs, these secure technical implement implementation guides. So this is kind of like the 
the knowledge, but it's in, in, in so-called digital paper format, right? And so one of our missions is to take that knowledge and turn that into uh, submissions against the compliances code repo according to the recommendations that you find in those guides, right? And so that's number one. And then number two, we pick one of the risk management profiles that we're targeting. So for example, if we're targeting the Australian essential eight, we'll take all of that knowledge on the left and we'll build an essential eight uh, profile and put that on the Git repo. In fact, there's a link on this slide to that exact profile, right? We've just recently got a submission for from our Australian team uh, specific to the uh, essential eight. And then lastly, there, as I said, there's two parts of the uh, code. There's the narrative that describes things, and then there's attestation to do the check, and then there's remediation to bring that system into compliance. And what you see below those are just different facilities that can be enabled to do attestation and remediation. In the case of OpenShift, you know, uh, Kirsten mentioned that OpenShift uh, was using Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes, right? And so um, we are working on this concept of a compliance operator. And it's, it's really cool in the sense that once that operator is installed on your cluster, you can feed it a FISMA profile, a FISMA moderate profile, and it will bring that system into full compliance with that profile according to how it's defined. And, it, and it's, it's a phenomenal thing, and, and the leverage that we're gonna get from that is gonna be really cool. And so this is the process. So you got documentation and sometimes tribal knowledge that's baked into your organization in, in the heads of many uh, of the people. And we wanna get that from uh, the docs from that tribal knowledge into something that uh, we can act against from a software perspective. So uh, that's what we're doing here with Compliance as Code. And so we've started this. Uh, there is a community upstream. Um, this is a, uh, a screenshot from one of our uh, public sector uh, meetups where we're talking about innovation and using open control. There's quite a few folks, uh, Microsoft, Pivotal, and some others are members of the open control uh, community and have contributed their own compliance as code profiles. So we're starting to grow quite a bit there. And we've also created uh, a derivative of that. We call it ATO Pathways, where it shows kind of the Red Hat product status against the uh, authoritative information that you'll find in the compliance as code repo. And then uh, lastly, there's a few uh, links that you can uh, look at to go a little bit deeper. In Compliance as Code, the first GitHub link is the number one, is the top one. And then the Red Hat uh, specific one is second. And then the open control community you'll find uh, at, at the last bit. So that's all I had today. Um, hopefully this was a good overview of Compliance as Code and I'm happy to take any questions.